Well, um, we have little time and I have lots of slides, so we really have to go full speed ahead. Are you still Googling or are you already crawling the title of my presentation today? And I think there is something in it for everyone, for brands, for manufacturers, uh, for retailers, something strategic. And we want to give you some um, approaches for pricing and to make progress with AI. My name is Sebastian Klum. I'm the CEO of explain in Stuttgart and part of the Parsonate group. Some of you will know this. Uh, I also I work in the PIM context um, f since 2020. I've been the CEO of the company we used to be called Price Intelligence because we looked after prices. Now we have uh, clearly expanded our product portfolio so much for our shop window. Let me briefly give you a status quo on e-commerce and retail. Uh, then ask you to change your perspective and provide you the five optimization approaches. We will start with the current uh, status quo on the market. It's quite interesting to see the uh, difference between the marketplaces. We've got uh, consumer business uh, brands are selling more online, selling through marketplaces. So there's a massive change going on since COVID. Uh, there's a lot of movement. We have uh, overstock. We have the consumption climate, lots of insolvencies. I also lost four or five uh, retail customers last year. So the market is really in upheaval and uh, wholesale is struggling um, massively right now. Looking at uh, retail, the 2019 after COVID, this is the curve. We've basically achieved pre-COVID uh, um, sales. There's this lateral movement this year, but still the positive growth um, effects, especially in e-commerce. Uh, physical retail, retail is different but e-commerce is set to continue to grow. This is the current situation we're facing in retail. On the other hand, we have the marketplaces. Um, in the Dach region, by 2024, 42% um, of sales will be accounted for by marketplaces. So you see how important they are. What we see here is uh, the manufacturers that uh, sell massively through marketplaces, um, circumventing wholesalers. Everybody knows Amazon and the market power, it will um, decrease, but everything will consolidate. Uh, marketplaces are the big game and everybody wants to take part. Uh, wholesale uh, is hardly done on marketplaces. The wholesalers have left the marketplaces. Why should they compete with the brands? And we can also feel this uh, um, fewer uh, retail customers or wholesale customers and more brands. Uh, there are many, many marketplaces, Comundo. This is the landscape uh, uh, of uh, the Dach region in B2C, in B2C. Whether it's Kaufland, Otto, or the media market, uh, um, they started with solutions such as Miracle to build marketplaces. Uh, then the colleagues uh, of Klingel, we actually built a marketplace with them, and this continues. Everyone with traffic says, well, I can also sell goods in a different manner without uh, uh, incurring risks. Of course, there's a consolidation. As Alundra is experiencing a rocky ride at the moment, and uh, also Amazon is uh, making people redundant, but um, less retailers, few retailers, more marketplaces. This is only B2C, uh, but in B2B it's very similar. B2B is increasingly opening up. Uh, um, this is heatedly disputed, no lock-in issues. Uh, skilled craftspeople actually uh, shop uh, at Marcateo for their tools. And this is why brands are so interested to uh, flood the marketplaces and toy with marketplaces. When you looked at direct-to-consumer business, and it's not the brands that we know from Amazon, like Smocks for Socks uh, from Mannheim, uh, not a digital native, uh, but Tommy Hilfiger or Kevin Klein, um, not digital natives, they are really flooding this business. They're selling themselves. This is really a growth market um, compared with the rest. Um, there is shift happening. I'm excited to see where the trend goes. But uh, we're uh, actually shifting from retail to brands. Uh, let's see what uh, remains after all of the upcoming consolidations. But there are also many benefits in this. 
there are new markets emerging, new topics are being created, and this is why we need to shift the perspective. It's always about portfolio, quantity, price, and discounts, and these need to be right. Whoever does not have a clear claim for shoppers will lose out. The shoppers need to know why they should shop here rather than there. What's the difference at the end of the day? And this is why things need to be automated. Uh, investment in IT must be made uh, to actually uh, come to grips with the range, with the portfolio and the prices and the discounts. When you look at uh, H&M, Zara, fast fashion, uh, typical providers, and all of a sudden Sheen um, emerges from Asia and they're going through the roof in Google roofs, uh, search trends in no time, an incredible shift. So we're not only uh, buying from Chinese on a marketplace, but we're buying from the Chinese direct. They are actually delivering faster than anybody uh, before them. Or Temu is even hotter when you can see the traffic in terms of visitors in the US. So even faster than Sheen. This is real time fashion in a, rather than ultra fast fashion. Sheen, um, you've probably heard the name quite often. They crawl social media channels. They crawl the big platforms. They look at price comparisons. They get uh, inspiration for their portfolios in real time from competitors and from uh, social media and the big platforms. And uh, then they virtually place the goods. And once it's sold, it is produced and shipped from China direct to Germany. This is what's going on now. And uh, this is why um, you need to use the data that is available out there in an automatic fashion to really be in a pull position. We actually say, uh, refer to this as market research based on steroids. Um, and now you can do both. You have a tremendous amount of data that you can use and it is even high quality data. But only few people do it or have done it so far. My five approaches as promised, the portfolio. And so I can look at brands, but I can also look at the retailers. I can re optimize portfolio and I can also use my product assortment. This works both ways. And at the end of the day, the data serve to actually produce the best offer. Because as I said, differentiation is the be all and end all. This is an, um, an example of online pharmacies. Some will definitely know Doc Morris, Medpex, Aponeo. Uh, this is also, Mannheim is also part of the Doc Morris group. Um, they have exactly the same portfolio. Why should I shop with one rather than with the other? Maybe I know Doc Morris a little better than Medpex and probably have more uh, uh, confidence in them. Maybe they supply faster, maybe they're more reliable, but at the end of the day, the price counts. And this data can be collected, captured, the catalogs can be captured. So all of the categories can be saved, whether it's the uh, headache tablets uh, can be collected and compared. And what we do we do this for portfolio or assortment assortment uh, parts where we uh, compare brands with each other. You're with Tommy Hilfiger, for instance. We match the data and simply look at easy things. But this is often still done manually and you probably look at it once a month, once a quarter, once a season, but you don't do it real time or every hour. And... Um, you can look at uh, uh, how many products uh, do my competitors have? Do I have fewer or do I have more? And how do they um, uh, stand out? What is the categories that I'm stronger in? And I can use this for marketing purposes. When I have more grill types, then I can also advertise this. And this can be done in automated fashion. Otherwise, the category managers would spend days and weeks to actually find out uh, the differences. There's still people looking for prices manually, doing the comparisons manually. Um, they actually waste days and weeks on this. And people are really stressed out because they have to collect this data manually. Then you can also look at the different price levels. Uh, are, am I in the better position in the price range? from uh, zero to 10 euros than meat packs. What about the various categories? This can also be done with BI tools, with your own or with our suite, for instance. At the end of the day, 
The point is to identify gaps where the blank space is or where am I better positioned than my competitor, uh, where the ratings better, the reviews, and how are the dynamics changing over time? When are they adding new products? Uh, when are they delisting products? Uh, in which which categories are growing fast? And I can actually draw my conclusions from this. But you can top it all by machine learning. But instead of saying, well, I draw the data in an automatic fashion from the uh, internet, um, uh, but I add machine learning models in addition. And when I uh, look at the Logitech presenter, it's comparable. Um, when I offer it as MediaMarkt or Evonix, then I will find it's the same product. But when I look at the uh, one-seater or two-seater, uh, or black blouse, for instance, uh, then this is uh, not as easily comparable. And well, there are unique identifiers that are very helpful. And when you train machine learning models um, for a text comparison or image comparison or attribute comparison, and use then AI to make uh, items comparable, then you can actually look at your own ranges uh, you can uh, deep dive when you have a million articles then it's uh, really difficult to know what you have on your platform Zalando faces this problem right now they're starting to massively delist smaller brands because they found that uh, the user experience is no longer so cool uh, because the ranges are growing growing like with Amazon and you can't set any filters uh, shoppers no longer find what they want and these possibilities do exist. Zalando is not doing it yet. They don't do any machine learning. They don't look at the images uh, and compare the similarities. Um, because uh, when you compare similarities, you could also identify competitive items on Amazon. If you don't know what your competitive is, which digital native trends exist out there, then I can capture uh, the data, apply machine learning, and then you can identify whether they're the same or not. You can also, uh, when you have a Tommy Hilfiger item, for instance, uh, then you actually weigh it uh, with machine learning and then actually identify similar products. Uh, then I can weigh it for the on trends, on the title, and at the end you will see there are two similar. Probably I need more dresses in different colors and styles or uh, higher fashion levels and, and silhouettes. Then um, the uh, portfolio means that you should permanently capture the data and then actually look at the, the data over time. Are there new products added? Are there new categories added? And then I can analyze my competitor a lot better. Mm, they seem to have found something because they're adding so many products to this category and the reviews are so good. I, this is where I need to be as well. Approach number two, um, sales channels. This is currently the pain point, marketplaces. Nobody's saying it openly, but it's a fact. It's the retail um, versus the brand. There are many brands cooperating well with retailers and they're saying, I would never undercut the price or step them on their foot because they're my best buddy, they're selling most of my stuff. But they're all on marketplaces because honestly, they're making more money there because they're not sharing the commission. And this is why there is a struggle going on, a war waging. All brands are trying to actually get to the marketplaces and this takes a lot of effort. There are three, four to five people in a team uh, trying to actually make a, a Amazon fly or a Zalando fly without um, giving it some thought whether this specific range really makes sense on Amazon or Zalando. Or shouldn't I first uh, identify what makes sense on which marketplace? We internationalize, we actually include 15 further marketplaces and then we invest and nobody actually calculates whether it really pays off when you deduce the commission. So the pointer is, it is pretty simple to screen the marketplace once, uh, compare it or match it with one's own products, to compare the price range, and then identify whether it really makes sense to actually be presented on this marketplace. Prices. Um, this is approach number three. This is a favorite topic of ours. Um, 
And uh, nobody likes price stomping. And I repeat the time and again because the brands always approach us and say, tell us the retailer who marks down first. Yeah, sure, we can do that. We can track them and say th he was the one who marked down first and too early. But at the end of the day, no retailer wants to do that. They want to make money. So they also want to keep their margin high as, as long as possible. Th the problem is whether I have a uh, Hoover robot um, uh, uh, it is not offered in a vacuum. Um, it is comparable, this product. And when you look at the uh, Germans, uh, um, that uh, 60 to 70% uh, select the uh, Idealo to search a product, then you know they're only interested in the price. Um, it's not among the top 100. And the same applies to retail and brands uh, to the same extent. Whether I'm B2B or B2C manufacturer, I also have to make sure whether the retailers actually undercut my price. So I have to permanently track prices. I have to constantly doing that. And uh, this needs to be on an hourly basis, mostly on a daily basis and weekly, depending on the range. Um, but I can infer so many price strategies. How do my competitors act? When do they mark down the prices for specific products? And th by the same token, I can follow and track competitors' prices when I'm a brand. In Yorp and Tommy Hilfiger, I track the address prices and then can actually adapt my prices accordingly so that I'm the winner. So prices are an exciting topic uh, for inferring strategies. This is the brand area we're serving, where brands are very interested. This is premium sports brand, by the way, and they want to know um, uh, how the products are positioned in which price, price range and who marks it down first. But very often the, the question reads, who's the price driver? Who is the one who marks down the prices first? This is usually Amazon. Very often they still have good prices. They're not always the cheapest though, but when you look at across a number of brands, uh, then uh, you will usually find that Amazon is the price driver. Brands talk uh, to retailers and um, they try to agree with retailers to not mark down too early because if one starts to mark down prices, then the, the rest will follow. And this is taking place. This is not a price collusion, but you agree on the time needed until prices are marked down. Then you can identify price trends. We do many Cyber Week and Black Friday analyses. We tell um, the uh, we can say that uh, the competitor or the marketplace only marks down uh, marks down the prices two days early, and then uh, the competitor follows at midnight the following day. So I really have to stay on the ball. Then buy box. This is still one of the most important topics. As a rule, we have many buy boxes, not only the Amazon buy box, there's the Zalando buy box. And this is a Hugo Boss example. On the right hand side, uh, you see uh, size 32 for Zalando. On the left hand side, you can see the Heiger Hagemeyer store in Minden. Um, that offers a size 42. Zalandi only presents one, so not all offers for one size uh, are featured, only one. In this particular case, the Hagemeyer store in Minden, probably the only store that actually stocks the size uh, 42, and uh, they probably thought, because I'm the only one left, I can actually offer it to 10, 10 euros more. Whether Hugo Boss really likes this, I don't know, because the category list says 279, and then the uh, shopper actually selects uh, at the buy box and then it is 10 euros uh, more expensive at uh, this in this price range it's not so much of a problem but with lower priced items this can prove a problem Zalando has created a special situation during COVID, Zalando allowed uh, retailers from uh, the city center um, and th they actually sold their one-off pieces to f all through Zalando. And um, in many area, um, in many areas, a black box opened up. Um, for some brands, uh, it was perfectly unclear why they generated no more sales on several marketplaces. But this was a total black box. Nobody shares this. That is, Zalando is not saying 
saying, well, this is my data, take my data, so you know what's happening with your merchandise. We actually linked Zalando and actually analyzed this data and told the brands who was selling their brands. Um, it was probably the, the Hagemeyer store in Minden. And now brands are starting to uh, actually also do the buy box game. And they're undercutting their own retailers' prices now in order to actually sell the item. And this is done on auto... Um, uh, this is an auto seller. This is the on quality. You will probably know this. This is also a service provider that helps uh, brands to enter marketplaces. And you can see uh, that when you click on auto, there are more offers available than just this one. But again, it's. Uh, um, about the uh, cheapest price, the shipping price, those shipping price to really sell the bargain. Then MediaMark, the same thing. They st uh, the back store. E everything turned into a platform. The question is, which platform will survive if the range or the portfolio is the same everywhere? So it's only a price question, I think. Kaufland... Uh, uh, this is getting exciting, also even for premium fashion brands, which really confused me. But premium fashion brands are highly interested in Kaufland. This seems to be working extremely well, whether they did their analytics, I don't know. But everybody wants to sell on the Kaufland platform. Then, approach number four, win the digital shelf. We have a uh, uh, portfolio and price here involved as well. A trivia question that we're often asked um, uh, at Klingel, we also fought hard for it. Um, did the article really go online on Otto or Amazon? Oh yeah, the trader usually says, yes, it's all online. Amazon said, and we found, no, this is not true. The article is not online. A simple question. You would assume that your merchandise is online, but you realize that there are no sales made, and then you wonder why. And this does not have to do with out of stock, but simply with uh, whether the article was really listed and went online. To just check this and uh, receive a feedback can really help to generate turnover on marketplaces, but hardly anybody does this and the marketplaces don't offer the service either. Out of stock is an issue nevertheless. An example by Gardena. Um, one of, uh, I know that I Gardena, uh, that I can, sold my items to a Bauhaus, uh, but th they often don't know whether they were really listed. Has Bauhaus really listed or managed to list the product? Uh, and actually manage the product data. To, um, and this takes uh, weeks, often even months. And this is why companies such as Gardena, bread manufacturers, um, are very active on the Bauhaus uh, platforms or the Amazon platforms to make sure whether all of the uh, um, articles have gone online. And if this is not the case, then they actually contact the platforms and talk to them. An IT guy, for instance, uh, um, can, who can uh, capture the data and make sure that this data is really online. And w once the data is online, you have to track whether they're out of stock. And this is also done constantly. What I see very often is that product managers actually enter the shops uh, day by day and see whether the item is still online. They do it in the morning for 100 of their products and they do it by hand on many, many retail platforms and on many, many marketplaces. There were 40 people and did this for the price. Every morning they actually entered Idealo, searched for 100 product by hand, uh, looked at the prices, edited it, and then they were online the following day. We automated this, and the same applies uh, to such out-of-stock issues. Is the goods, uh, are the goods available, or are they in stock? Or oh, I can help, but I need to know. Then positioning. We know this, and SEO, uh, uh, the search engine optimization, um, decreasing in importance. Now we've arrived at retail. We thought about it in the past and said, how can we make search engine look the way that uh, shoppers really find what they're looking for? Now the brands are doing this job. An example here, let's stick to Gardena. 
at the top, uh, water supply connections, uh, garden. We enter the garden as a keyword in the search engine. And uh, I asked, um, are, am I among the top 10 results? Uh, uh, at which percentage uh, point? Uh, and the brands uh, constantly optimize the product data. The text is constantly adapted like we did for Amazon in the past. Now this is also done for Kaufland and for the auto platform. So it's done for every shop because it pays off. Once you actually achieve the position number one, it's great. But when I talk to companies such as a Hey Connect or OnQuality that help brands to enter such marketplaces, they tell them, uh, you don't do this without doing retail media. media. Sponsored, yeah? Look for the sponsored. So the one, two, three, four rows are sponsored, whether it's uh, with Zalando or Amazon, it's always that case. So you have to do sponsoring when you want to sell on marketplaces. I heard a figure that I found very fascinating lately. The global ad market of newspapers is lower than the retail media turnover by Amazon. Oh, that's brutal, isn't it? And it's only about being found on Amazon. I have to advertise. And what brands have to do, they have to check this. Uh, are the sponsored ads really still online? Because Auto does not feed back this information either. Either So you ha the, they have to find themselves whether their ads are really uh, online, whether their banners are on that. And we actually track this together with Gardena. Uh, last and fifth approach, customer experience content. It's all about the question, how do I present my brand out there? Is it, this is more of a brand case rather than a retail case. Here again, the Gardena example. We're talking with them about many of those things. Are all of the images online is the question here. Are they of a proper quality? Is the promotion image that I've sponsored, uh, was it really going online on day one as we agreed? Can you do this menu? Sure, but it's getting more and more complex. So you have to track this. We compare the Im images with the PIM system, for instance, and we tell uh, Gardena, yes, all of the images and the videos are online. The texts are all right. The title is correct and uh, for correctly formatted. And we match these. We go through the texts even and check whether the tone of the text is correct. And we also match uh, the attributes, for instance, yes, correct, there's no mistake in there. When you're in the uh, uh, medical area, when you're talking about pharmaceutical areas or textile labeling for the fashion segment in terms of the material composition, this is of essential importance because this also touches upon legal issues. Here, brands have really woken up. They want to check it. Uh, they actually lost control of it. Um, they're pushing over the merchandise and uh, they don't know how they don't know what's happening with their brand outside. Um, in earlier times, they had their displays, their back wall displays in retail stores, but this is no longer the case. But now they're starting to do that again, and they're starting to optimize the brand experience uh, um, and, and make sure that uh, the uh, brand experience stays the same. This is one of my favorite topics, uh, customer voice, and it's hardly being used in data-driven processes. We have so many customer reviews. There are companies such as Cominga who focused on customer reviews, but this is not really being leveraged. And this is what I meant when I said to quantity for qualitative market research. There are thousands of customer reviews out there and hardly anybody looks uh, at them. Some brands are responding, oh, stars, we only have four stars instead of five stars. Then they try to respond and act, but the potential, the underlying potential is not being leveraged. So you can wonderfully analyze how I stand as a brand, Baba, Google, uh, com in comparison with the others. What is the uh, feel about my products out there in the world? Is it changing? Is it uh, improving or deteriorating? How am I perceived as a brand out there? So there is a lot of fallow land to be tapped into. 
you can actually look at it over time, how it develops over time, but you can even drill down further for the portfolio process, again, referring to retail. You can also, uh, I was a little too fast here. Well, I can't go back. The system allow me to, doesn't allow me to. Uh, um, you can wonderfully uh, also enter on the attribute level. So I really read uh, the review. What attributes are really good, others which are poor, and how do I fare compared with my competitor? Of course, uh, you can also take this over for print. I can analyze ever so well where I actually have uh, uh, advantages over others. And I can actually include this in my website, but also include it in my uh, flyers. And Google Shopping, Zalando, Amazon, uh, Amazon, there are dozens of uh, reviews that you can download and then analyze with AI and then actually infer your conclusions. With shoe manufacturers, we do this. When we find um, there are um, um, comments or reviews too small or um, the uh, um, metal uh, point hurts, then the shoe manufacturers ad adapt their production um, and they can react to those mistakes or errors uh, more quickly, the tip of the iceberg. So there is a lot of potential that we should tap into when it comes to reviews. Sheen does it. They look at these topics, these issues, and then adapt their ranges, their products, and actually inject more innovation. Uh, we worked for Hey Connect lately. They actually have helped many fashion brands to, to come to marketplaces. We downloaded many, many reviews for many products and at the end we actually analyzed this, uh, them uh, in actually a, a, a compilated text. Nobody wants to look at 5,000 reviews in PIM uh, because uh, they did not want to do that on Amazon either. So you highlight the attributes and you write summaries on the reviews. What is the problem about this dress? Why do I have all of these returns that I couldn't control? What are the reasons? This massively helped to decrease the number of returns. Marketplace business in particular, they, redu they reduced by 30 to 40 percent, which saved a lot of money. And uh, this was also fed back into the production process. And uh, the brand improved the quality. They were aware of the problems. And uh, th this is free. This, uh, this data is, is complementary, basically, and is not used uh, enough. I come to the end of my presentation. Uh, uh, I brought along a Gardner quote. They say that by 2026, organizations that invest in digital shelf analytics applications, what I mentioned before, will see their costs reduced by 30% annually. And when you think that 40 to 50 people are sitting there, category managers, product managers, and, um, look for prices manually via Idealo, um, will know that uh, this is a lot of money you could save if you automate it. On the other hand, Gartner also says, and this is what we discuss with many PIM manufacturers, this needs to be embedded, integrated. We see companies that buy data capture for 24 months and worldwide and covering all of the platforms. And we push gigabytes of data across and 24 months later, they actually terminate uh, because they haven't used the data because they couldn't leverage the data. So what we uh, say is uh, create BI for our customers in one-on-one uh, -on -one projects to make the data visible. So the management sees it uh, so that strategic conclusions can be drawn or we feed it back to systems. And this is why this is so important, as Gartner says, that the data is captured, but that um, data is also needs to be fed back to uh, PIM or syndication systems to serve as enrichment again, so that uh, you are better positioned on marketplaces afterwards. 
nobody wants to read the 1000 reviews i have to prepare them in a in such a way combine them in such a way that it uh, is featured in a pim uh, ideally with competitive prices we know that people hate to change their windows or, or screenshots they don't want to see five or six different systems um, you need to integrate it in a window that people use on a daily basis so you need to meaningfully integrate such uh, features exactly um i said everything before we capture data worldwide we have a pricing background and this is why we study hundreds of thousands of web shops and platforms if uh, so uh, desired we also linked uh, competitors shops uh, that are not in our portfolio yet uh, so there's also project business we do not only standard software we now have focused on digital self uh, analytics and pricing with the data we capture and we have b2c customers b2b customers many big brands that we serve this is just a small extract uh, in a wide variety of sectors some only get raw data and do their own bi others use the suite and do bi evaluation with us or get a dashboard built by us uh, so there's a wide range really and apart from that we're part of the parsnet group have 200 employees and the data we capture uh, can be shared with the colleagues and uh, integrated in PIM or database projects to, to optimize processes. Thank you very much. That was it for me.